building, and it now houses a drugstore, a health center, and offices for Northeastern University, another great example of, of a partnership. Uh, in closing, I think the ultimate expression of this evolution is what, what uh, Barry Bluestone has been building at Northeastern in the last few years. He created something called the Center for Urban and Regional Policy. He described it as a think and do tank, which I think is a great phrase. It is a research center focused on urban issues, but it is a policy center focused on turning good ideas into action. And so this is a university-based entity which, which does fundamental research, let's say, on urban housing, uh, but at the same time then figures out how we can draft legislation and get legislation through the legislature that actually promotes affordable housing uh, given the structures that, uh, that we're working with. And this is one of many things that the, the Center for Urban Regional Planning has accomplished. And finally, so that the far end of this progression uh, is the school that we're talking about, which is the first school I know of, it, of, of its kind uh, in the country where we're creating a school with high academic ambitions, a school of urban and what is it now called very Public policy and urban affairs. Public policy and urban affairs, which begins with the premise of a partnership with the city of Boston. This, this school was, was founded in discussions at Parkland House, which the mayor convened in which he brought, Judith was probably there, uh, in which he brought uh, department heads from all over the city to sit down with academics from Northeastern and say, how can we build a curriculum? How can we build a research program for this school that addresses the needs of the city and also helps educate young people and provides research opportunities for our faculty? A, a whole school founded on the notion of partnership, that education and research can flourish in a partnership with an urban partner. I, I, just, I just think it's a wonderful and powerful uh, conception. And so, so what we have seen, and I think we are, we are sitting in the middle of a great example of it, uh, is really the emergence of a new type of institution at the upper end of the academic uh, status system in which elite, private, selective, academically ambitious national and international <laughs> universities are also saying we want to embrace the life of the city around us in every aspect of what we do and make that central to our definition of ourselves. It's a great phenomenon. It's so wonderful to see it emerge in my lifetime. I will say in closing that it's not perfect. Uh, we have a long way to go, and there are, in, there are tensions still in this partnership. As I discovered, after the Patriots won the Super Bowl for the first time, and Northeastern students in their Enthusiasm for that victory uh, got out of hand, as students are wont to do. And, uh, I was greatly embarrassed by this, but it did a lot of damage in the neighborhood. I suspect there are people sitting in this room who were living in uh, homes that were affected by this. It was not a happy chapter in the history of Northeastern. Uh, and we realized once again how much work there is to do to manage some inherent tensions between the academic life of the university and the civic life in which we are embedded. So those tensions aren't going away, but at least we have, I think, a new consciousness of partnership, which is producing great benefits for us all. Thank you. Well, uh, Richard and uh, Judith have done such a marvelous job, uh, I think, putting the uh, a rich mix of issues relating to uh, leadership, civic engagement, and collaboration on the table that uh, I hope I can be very brief so we can get into uh, uh, the discussion. Um, foundations are, are another example of, of uh, institutions that are evolving, or at least some of them are, in, in very, very interesting uh, ways. You know, uh, philanthropy is one of the really distinctive things about our society. There's just no place else in the world where people or institutions give away uh, the amount of money that we do every year. A quarter of a trillion dollars last year was uh, uh, given away by uh, individuals and institutions for uh, charitable uh, purposes. It's uh, really quite extraordinary, and there's no other country that's close on either a relative or an absolute uh, basis. That, in turn, has uh, spawned an enormous 
nonprofit sector in this country, which is far larger than the nonprofit sectors anywhere else, and we rely on the nonprofit sector for much more higher education being one example uh, uh, than, uh, than other societies uh, do. Most philanthropy, though, it, it goes to institutions with whom the giver has some personal association, religious organizations being the largest recipients of charitable gifts. And, and second, behind that are educational institutions where people have some personal uh, uh, connection. Uh, only a relative sliver of that uh, quarter of a trillion dollars goes to explicit social improvement or social justice uh, or, or, or deliberate conscious efforts to change society. But it's a very, very important sliver and the Boston Foundation represents that, that part of, of philanthropy, at least in the, uh, in the main. Um, uh, the Boston Foundation has been around a long time, over 90 years. It goes back to the dawn, really the dawn of organized philanthropy. We're one of 700 plus community foundations in the country. Most foundations are private foundations set up by individuals or families. We're a public charity. Uh, our resources, which currently number about $800 million in assets, come, have come from literally thousands of contributors uh, uh, over, that, uh, over that time. And for most of its 90 plus years, the Boston Foundation was a very quiet behind the scenes institution. It started by uh, idealistic uh, Brahmin bankers uh, uh, back at the beginning of the last uh, century. They're, they're, the idea of the Boston Foundation was to do good quietly. And the theory of change was that if we would fund uh, wonderful nonprofit organizations, they would do great things. Uh, and that uh, theory was very sound. Uh, if you look at the history of the Boston Foundation, which is really quite remarkable in terms of prescient investments in, uh, in people and ideas, and in many cases in ideas for new uh, institutions that were needed in the city. Um, so, the, so just some examples to go back to the 1950s, for instance, the Boston Foundation provided the seed capital for WGBH as it became a public television station and birthed the whole public television movement. We were partners in, the, in one of the first anti-poverty programs in the United States in the 60s, uh, early 60s, ABCD, Action for Boston Community Development, that recently lost their longtime director, uh, uh, Robert Court. The neighborhood health centers that Judith Curlin mentioned, most of them got their seed capital uh, from the Boston Foundation. The community development corporations that made Boston one of the top cities in the country for neighborhood revitalization. All of them got their early backing and seed capital uh, from the Boston Foundation. Even something as, as uh, really uh, significant and massive as the cleanup of the Boston Harbor that has happened within recent memory, one of the great urban environmental success stories of our time, really happened uh, because of advocacy <coughs> organizations that were funded by the Boston Foundation, that pushed and prodded and eventually even litigated uh, against state and federal authorities to fulfill their responsibilities to clean up uh, Boston Harbor. So the Boston Foundation, by any measure, for a very long time, has been a very high quality foundation with a reputation for making superb uh, investments and it has had a, a tremendous national reputation for decades. However, uh, a little less than a decade uh, ago, um, the trustees of the Boston Foundation were, were contemplating the imminent retirement of the longtime president, uh, my distinguished predecessor, Anna Faith Jones, and they weren't satisfied uh, with this track record, as great as it was, because they were looking out at the city and how the city was changing and observing the question of leadership, the question of the direction <coughs> of the city, and they were worried that though the political leadership remained very, very strong, uh, uh, particularly in the mayor's office, and we've had a strong mayor form of government that has been occupied by terrific leaders for a very long time, including our current mayor. Um, they saw sources of private leadership drying up. Business consolidation that uh, several speakers referred to was stripping away the old time CEO leadership that used to come from the private sector. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, has been an, an enormous civic force in this community for generations. Its influence uh, for very different reasons than the business community was uh, uh, on the way. And they thought that there was a, a, a real vacuum. Uh, 
that needed to be addressed. And so in that light, they asked the question, could the Boston Foundation become a different kind of institution? Could we continue doing the great grant making that we've been doing, but could we supply a portion of this leadership uh, 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 quotient that is really needed for a, a healthy city? After all, our mission is the betterment of greater Boston. We have some resources. We have some credibility. We probably have an ability to be a kind of a, a, a meeting ground where people could be brought together. We can help spark a new discussion uh, about some of the challenges uh, and issues and problems and also opportunities uh, that we have. And they came to the conclusion that the Boston Foundation could have uh, an even greater impact if it consciously sought to become a leadership institution. Not to take over the leadership of the city, not to set the agenda by itself, but to be a contributor uh, to the necessary uh, civic leadership. And behind that lies a conviction that perhaps not all uh, share, but that private leadership is very, very important as is political leadership. And if, it, that if you don't have it, a kind of imbalance, as Judith alluded to, uh, can really develop. You need idea generation from private leadership. You need support. You need to help the public sector realize there are different choices than the interest groups in the public sector sometimes would like to dictate. So for a whole host of reasons, the board of the Boston Foundation was convinced that private, uh, independent, credible leadership is crucial and that the Boston Foundation could have an impact. And the transformation that Barry referred to in his very kind introduction of me a, a, a while ago refers to um, the things that we have changed about the Boston Foundation. It, it has gone from a very quiet, behind-the-scenes institution that shunned publicity to an institution that frankly wants to be much more visible uh, in the community, wants to be influential, wants to be well-regarded and known. Uh, we are deeply engaged uh, with the public sector, which the Foundation uh, never was in the past. There is a fear in much of the Foundation world about getting involved with politicians or people in the public sector. We don't understand that world, we're suspicious of it, we don't want to be tainted with politics. For all those re familiar uh, worries about politics, uh, uh, many foundations elect to keep to themselves, as the Boston Foundation once did. Um, our, our view was very different in the context of this new idea about what the Boston Foundation can be. Uh, we, we, uh, we talked about the problems that we want to help solve in the community, and we realized that not a single one of them that we could think of could be solved without an effective partnership with the public sector. The public sector is simply too important. The resources there are too great. Their responsibilities uh, are very large. And it was a fantasy uh, that we could somehow uh, transform our city or help make material progress in such thorny issues as urban education and affordable housing uh, and health care and so on uh, without engaging the public sector. So we decided to take the risk of a very full, nonpartisan, but very uh, intense engagement with the public sector, particularly the city, but also the state government, because so much policy uh, that affects cities is really made in the state house as opposed uh, uh, to uh, city hall. We decided that important components of, 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 of the leadership we wanted to provide would, would come from providing good data, as Judith mentioned. So the Boston Foundation has a major research uh, uh, program underway. The platform of it is the Boston Indicators Project, which you have mentioned, our collaboration with the, uh, with the city. But we commission a great deal of, of, of research, taking advantage of the Barry Bluestones of the world and the think tanks at the other universities and some independent ones that are, are capable and are now providing, with our support and the support of other funders, a steady stream of very high quality and provocative research um, about the city, about the region, and about the state. And much of this research uh, has sh shown the capacity to stimulate uh, action. We also hold many public forums at the foundation. We've made the foundation into a place where people come on a regular basis, leaders uh, from all squadrons of, of the community to, uh, to debate and discuss these issues and to catalyze uh, the action that is necessary. So this is another example, perhaps not quite as dramatic uh, as the transformation of the urban university that Richard described, but I think of a necessary transformation of at least a portion of the philanthropic world if 
if philanthropy and foundations are to be uh, part of this uh, rich mix of, of institutions and sources of leadership that can give us a, a really a very vigorous um, uh, ability to attack the problems we have. Um, but it is, not, it is not easy. I think we're all describing a situation in Boston which is very, very favorable at the moment in terms of the health of these collaborations and the kind of leadership that is being provided. But it is a very, very challenging way to proceed. It's easier to keep to yourself when you're in control of what's happening and you can do things the way you like to do them. They, uh, a friend of mine once described collaboration as an unnatural act between non-consenting adults. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a serious point uh, behind that. Uh, the partners, uh, often at the outset, don't really understand what is driving the other partners, what their accountabilities are, what their needs are. And successful collaboration is really going to have to be built on building your understanding of what is driving uh, the other institutions or the other leaders or the other uh, people in the collaboration. And for a long time, that willingness to really engage and understand, to walk a mile in, for instance, the mayor's uh, shoes, as opposed to decrying politicians and you know, uh, wondering why they can't behave uh, differently uh, than they do. Uh, and so the current, I think, at least on a relative basis, highly favorable environment for a partnership and collaboration here was not arrived at easily. And we can remember times in this city when it was either unbalanced, as Judith said, or uh, missing altogether. And uh, a handy example is the condition of this city for most of the 20th century. Uh, you historians of Boston know that Boston, when Boston went into the Depression and lost much of its manufacturing base, it really didn't come out of it. Uh, until the 1980s. And uh, a big reason that Boston could not get out of the terrible doldrums that it was in was a kind of civic paralysis that was very much a function of the ethnic competition that was going on in the city at that point with the Irish taking political control of the city at the turn of the last century, but the very powerful Brahmin business communities retaining control of state government and, and business and jobs in the city uh, and it was a very, very uncomfortable uh, uh, phenomenon. And unfortunately, much of the political leadership that the city did get for much of that period, from story figures like James Michael Curley and so forth, saw political advantage in actually exacerbating uh, the, the, the tensions and the differences as opposed uh, to calling people together. And that's why 1949 is regarded as such a pivotal moment when John Hines, also Irish, was elected mayor, uh, defeated uh, uh, someone who would have continued the Curley tradition. Um, uh, well, actually defeated James Michael Curley um, himself. And uh, at a Boston College Citizen Seminar, a very famous one, called for an end to this ethnic uh, strife. and embraced the, the business community and the contributions that the business community needed to make to a new Boston. And that kicked off in a, in, in a, in a very, very important way what became uh, uh, an ability of the city, which took some decades to flower, uh, but the ability of the city to move ahead on its problems and pull government, business, and community together in a way uh, that it simply hadn't been able to do uh, uh, for generations. So. That's all a way of saying that there's nothing automatic about this kind of rich environment of, uh, uh, of partnership. It's, it's, it's very difficult and it's very hard. And to go back to this recognition of each other's interests, uh, um, I think this is particularly true in the evolution of the higher education relationship where uh, some politicians, not our mayor, but some politicians in the city today, we saw it in the last mayoral election, it's just so tempting to take shots at higher education. It's, it's an easy one. It's a fat pitch to invoke those prejudices, the tax exemption, uh, etc. When, in fact, uh, the, the, uh, the extraordinary constellation of colleges and universities here represent uh, the, not only the current economic base uh, of the whole region, but our best hope for a uh, for a prosperous future. But it takes a higher order of political leadership uh, uh, to uh, which the mayor has really displayed on this to refrain from the easy 
uh, pot shot and in fact defend, as he did in the course of the mayoral campaign, which was quite remarkable, uh, to defend uh, the role of colleges and, and universities. But it also requires uh, a commitment to reconciling the very real conflicts that will continue to arise over institutional expansion uh, and, uh, and so forth. And the, the, the other partners have to recognize elected officials' unique situations and needs. They are on a ballot. Uh, they have to get uh, re-elected. They are going to be publicly accountable for their accomplishments or, or lack uh, thereof. Uh, there is a reason why uh, most elected officials want to get attention, want to take credit for good things, and it is inherent in the role they play. But uh, folks in the private sector can regard this uh, as sort of unseemly uh, behavior when a mature partner will recognize and in fact assist elected officials in getting uh, proper credit uh, f uh, for what for the good things that they are doing because that is the basis of the accountability of our uh, electoral uh, system. So uh, we do have a favorable environment here. Key institutions are evolving or changing their role to provide more leadership uh, in the community. It must be built on a frank recognition of the imperatives driving your partner institutions. And finally, I will say, it also has to rest on self-interest. I don't think anything you've heard tonight is really born more fundamentally of altruism than self-interest. We go back to the university example. The cities know they need the multiple benefits conferred by the presence of colleges and universities as permanent institutions. Uh, the, the institutions realize that their franchise and competitiveness will be enhanced if they are in the middle of thriving communities as opposed to deteriorating ones. So there's the old opposed interests have evolved into aligned interests that outstanding leaders like Judith Roden have articulated and driven forward and of course uh, become highly influential in the process. So it is, it is self-interest in, in, in the most positive a possible way that must lie at the basis of these uh, extraordinary partnerships. Thank you very much. Richard, do you, do you have a few minutes or? Okay, well thank you. Richard has to leave for another meeting, but I want to thank him again. Being the last evening of the semester, uh, and we still have uh, some wonderful questions, I'm sure. We're going to skip our normal break. If anybody's really upset about that, see me afterwards. <laughs> um, or take a break. <laughs> or take a break. The, the fact is, is that this has been a marvelous discussion we've had about a, a set of institutions that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, I should also tell you, now that he's left so I don't make him embarrassed, Richard played an incredibly important role in the development of both the Center for Urban and Regional Policy, now the Dukaka Center, and the school. He was president. Indeed, he was the one who hired me here. He was the one who said, set up a think and do tank when we talked about it. And he was also the one who said, it's time we built a school devoted to this as well. Uh, so I want to thank Richard for that. It's also true that part of the reason why our school has been so successful and the Dukakis Center has been so successful is because of our partnership with both the city, uh, not only working with the mayor, but working very closely with the Boston Redevelopment Authority, uh, with the leaders of that organization in the past, with the research department, and then especially because of this very close relationship that the Dukakis Center and the school have had with the Boston Foundation on issues of housing, and manufacturing, and a whole lot of other so what's wonderful about it is we not only have this set of institutions, but they actually are beginning and have been working together in ways that are not true in other cities. One of the problems in Detroit, as I was growing up in Detroit, uh, and it was going through the problems that Boston had, and Boston had them before Detroit, is Detroit never could get the civic leadership and the public leadership together. The mayor could not work with the private sector, the university, particularly Wayne State University, which I was associated with, played almost no role in the city whatsoever. The Catholic Church tried to play a role, but played a small role. It really didn't have this rich fabric of private and public sector institutions working together. And that's part, not certainly the sole reason, why Detroit is in such terrible shape today 
and why Boston has had, according to the title of a book I once wrote, a red of the Boston Renaissance.